on already. Okay, good. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for coming to this afternoon session with uh, distinguished poet Liang Li. It's a beautiful uh, and sunny afternoon and Sunday, so I really appreciate your presence here. Um, Liang was born to uh, Chinese parents in Indonesia, and uh, uh, on their way to the States, they spent about five years uh, traveling through this particular of China, Hong Kong, Macau, Japan, and in the 1960s, settled in the United States. Um, uh, Lian's poetry has received many honors, including three Pushcart Prizes, the Lenin Literary Award and the American Book Award. His collection of uh, poetry, Book of My Nights, was the winner of the Poetry Societies of American, America's William Carlos Williams Award. Um, so, Leon, um, I, I know that you have been compared to many poets, for example, uh, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, William Carlos Williams, and T.S. Eliot. I think the list can go on, on the one hand. On the other hand, you, 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 you wrote about um, that uh, you learned English through your father's reading of uh, King James Bible, and also uh, your father's recitation of Chinese um, uh, town and Song Dynasty poetries. Uh, I, I wonder if and how those voices that uh, echo through your poetry and how to stay sane uh, by um, combining all those different voices in your poem. Thank you. Well, is this on? Can you hear me? <clears throat> you know, my, my feeling is that they are many voices, but the poetry that I grew up loving, uh, I think it all points to the same thing. Uh, it, uh, it points to a, <clears throat> a kind of uh, deep primordial mind, whether it's Dickinson or uh, Shakespeare or Du Fu or Li Bai or you know, Su Dong Po or, uh, or the Psalms of the the Bible or the Gospels, you know, all of those things. I think all of that language points to, it has always pointed to a comprehensive mode of being. Mm. And so I always felt there wasn't much difference. Mm. The, the differences are differences in inflection or something, or, or in like dialectical difference or di dialects, you know, if we have, uh, I'm just wondering now why we call them dialects. What are, uh, but, um, yeah, so it seems to me like all of that kind of language points to the same thing, you know. This is a strange hour to be talking about poetry, and I don't know why. Right? We should... I always feel like poetry should be talked about in the morning or in the evening or in the middle of the night. This is a weird hour. I, I don't know. Did, did that make sense? Yes. Oh, I, okay. I, I like the idea that you uh, also talked about... Um, a poetry is a kind of projections, yeah. And then uh, right. a, a poetry. I, I think in one of the one of the conversations that you mentioned that um, um, a, a poem is an image of the maker. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, and also, uh, a, but a poem doesn't simply transpose being; it also proposes possibilities of being. So I was wondering that how that it's all possible with this very diverse background, and also with this um, coming together of the East and the West um, mentalities and philosophies of looking at the beings. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder that in your poetry, how would, how would you to contain those forces in your poems? You know, on the one hand, I, I feel as if <clears throat> we do it every day. Uh, just by breathing or walking or anything we do. You know, the, the great uh, Greek philosopher Heraclitus, he said that uh, the logos, the word, is the founding, uh, what do you want to call it? The founding law of all of the entire universe, right? And he described the logos as uh, the dynamism of opposites. That's a Western thought. It's a very deep thought. Uh, all the philosophers after him devel developed that thought, and a lot of even our technology uh, is uh, founded on binary, a binary system, 
you know, a dynamism of opposites. Well, in the East, that was developed very fully, you know, uh, as Tai Chi, which is translated as um, ultimate opposites. So every time you even walk, you know, we're practicing Tai Chi, right? I mean, when, you, when, you t when, you, when we step left and right, left and right, one leg always has to fill up and the other one is empty. The empty leg moves forward and then it fills up and the, the, other, the, the other leg is empty. So we're practicing this dynamism of opposites or the logos or the word or Tai Chi all the time. And we do it when we breathe too. You know, we get filled with breath and we empty. And we fill with breath and we empty. This emptiness and fullness, this practicing of the dynamism of opposites goes on all the time. But I think when we practice, uh, I want to say all art, but I'll, I'll say poetry, we enter into a kind of uh, uh, very deep, I think, contact with this logo, so with Tai Chi, you know, which is, uh, you know, uh, sense and nonsense, uh, language and silence, uh, uh, form and void. I mean, every artist deals with that, you know, form and void, you know. I'm looking at all these paintings, they, they're over, they're overweighted by, f these aren't paintings, these are photographs, right? They're overweighted by form, say, right? So the, uh, the opposite would be the void. You're trying to look for the void. And you see that in Chinese ancient paintings, right? A lot of meditation on empty space, voidness, how a little form can make the void even stronger. Poetry is the same thing, you know, I think. Am I addressing you or am I talking to you? I can't. <laughs> how does this work? All of it. Oh, okay. Um, so... Uh, does that make sense? So this uh, entrance into this rigor of the opposites, uh, uh, the dynamism of opposite Heraclitus, uh, is, uh, it's, it's neither east or west. It's just an, a very old truth, it seems to me, you know? I like the idea that you've been um, talking about this uh, opposites and contained with the opposites. And I'm impressed by the way you say there's a force uh, like in Tai Chi. But it seems to me that in your work, in your poetry, there's also a lot of vulnerability. Um, I mean, I, I'm recalling one of the well uh, anthologized poem of, of your early work, Pestiments. There are so much, so many forces, the strong, you know, you can see the, um, the, talk, the talk of war between the young uh, poet you and, and then Mrs. Walker. Mm -hmm. But then there's also this vulnerability that I, I wondered, what does that come from? this vulnerability in your poem that you feel that you need to address that? Mm. I don't know, maybe the practice of the kind of poetry I want to write is a, pra a practice of vulnerability, you know, but I, I do see vulnerability, a certain kind of vulnerability is a certain kind of power, you know, I think the most powerful language comes to me, ironically, uh, I don't like that word, ironic. <laughs> I want to de-ironize everything, you know? I think I, w I want more sincerity. I want more, uh, l less language games, you know? Uh, uh, I want to I get down to uh, some sort of, I don't know, a language of real feeling. Of, uh, I know this sounds insane, like, uh, it sounds uh, naive, I know. You'd think a man my age wouldn't be this naive, af especially after so many years of doing this. But I feel as if I'm, I'm after an authentic language of feeling, you know. And I don't think one can get there. A and thinking, feeling and thinking, you know. Uh, uh, but I don't think you can get there without practicing a kind of openness or vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, yielding yourself to the poem. You know, and uh, so I don't know. I don't know how that gets done, but uh, I think it's important to cultivate up to a point. You know, J John Keats, the English poet, yes. he said, uh, what did he call it? He called it ne negative capability, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was wondering because I, um, I've been a um, long time ago as a student been reading The, the Wind Seed, uh, your first, uh, I would say, uh, memoir. But, but there's a, a, a lots of autobiographical life experiences poems that in your poetry collections. I was wondering this question, why poetry particularly 
come to you? Because I know uh, among your siblings, there are also art, other artists. So I, I wonder, for, particularly for you, how, how poetry, how poetry found you, or you found poetry? No, I do, I do think I was kidnapped. I feel as if I was kidnapped <laughs> by poetry, you know? There's something about, uh, yeah, I mean, the minute I started writing, when I was started learning English, I started writing poems, you know? And it was always poems. You know, I don't know the real reason, you know, but, but if I had to guess, I would say poetry approximates uh, mm, being more than any other linguistic art form. It approximates the kind of saturation of meaning and being in the world, you know. I feel like when we are in the world, in fact, the world is a, is a wilderness of meaning, you know, it's just constant uh, bombardment and saturation of meaning and being coming to us from the outside, from the inside, you know, our psychologies, and, uh, the world itself, and so, and we're at this, uh, this meeting place between that kind of influx, and it seems to me that that kind of saturation of meaning and being is approximated most in poetry, because I do think that the paradigm for poetry is DNA, that is as much information as possible, as much emotional information, spiritual information, intellectual information, historical information, personal information, worldly information, as much information as possible, packed into as little space as possible, right? And so a reader's mind comes along, gets that DNA and resolves the DNA and manifests in the mind as a poem, you know, but uh, so a poet is like a writer of code. Mm. You're trying to encode as much information as possible into as little space as possible. And that seems to me the, the actual condition of life, mm -hmm. you know, that every cell, I mean, it would take, I mean, we could examine this little bud here. It's so full of information, right? It's just full of information, you know, and there's information just constantly coming at us everywhere. Look at this wall. It's insane, right? I don't know what to make of that. You, know, you go down to the street corner here, even just, just human-made information, you know, signs, you know, just keep replicating what the natural world does. I mean, you walk into a woods, and it's usually, there's just information constantly, right? Birds, you know, insects. I mean, there's just constant information, uh, trees breathing, and there's just dialogue uh, all the time, you know? I mean, the, the, Suf the great Sufi uh, poets understood that, you know? And they, they understood there was this giant mystical dialogue going on in the universe, you know, and I think poetry uh, uh, approximates that the most, and that's why it's the most interesting to me. Mm. Uh, I also, I, po I probably uh, wanted to uh, take you back a little bit, because uh, you mentioned about DNA, about uh, the, the, po the uh, poetry approximates beings, I think in this case would be the plural form. I, 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 um, I remember in the, in the very forward by Gerard Stein, um, in, in, in your first poetry uh, collection called Rose, and it seems it started with this. It started with a rosebud, and then everything that it come into uh, full bloom. Um, in, in his uh, foreword, Jared Stein spent uh, quite long passages talking about your father. So I wonder if you would like to uh, say a few words about your father's uh, experience and uh, how you were seeing your father taking different roles that that part of um, that life experience will shape you or formulate you somehow into the poet, a poet you are today. You know, my father was um, a complicated person. He was gifted, uh, passionate. Uh, yeah, and he taught me English. Uh, my mother taught me Chinese, my father taught me English, so I'm sure that must have accounted for, must account for something, you know. And then that he would teach me such an archaic, formal language as the, the English of the King James Bible uh, probably accounts for a lot, you know. But uh, I don't know, there's some sort of archetypal dance or rest, wrestling match that I'm doing with my father, I, I'm not sure what it is, you know, some sort of uh, encounter with an ultimate authority. You know, when I was a child, I mistook my father for God. 
I thought they were the same thing. You know, I, is that normal for people? <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's normal, but uh, it, ha- but, it, ha- but, it, it but it certainly is a, a godlike person to you. Yeah, yeah. And so that encounter with him was like an encounter with God. You yeah. know. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to use my advantage as moderator to ask one more question. So then I will open up to uh, the questions from the floor. So um, I-, I wanted to talk about, uh, just now you mentioned uh, your father taught you English and your mother taught you Chinese. And I often found that sometimes in your poetry, there is a mixture of words, Chinese and English. So I was thinking about, as a poet, that uh, when you write by using uh, air quotes, alien language to uh, the American audience. So were you that that's part of a particularly just saying, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care, for lack of a better word, whether my audience will know these words or what it means in the original language, or you have a, um, another agenda or purpose by using an alien language in your poem? You mean when I use Chinese? Well, yes, you also used some Chinese. I yeah. think in Persimmon as well. Yeah. And also in Cleveland, yeah. you're using uh, uh, Cantonese words. And, right. and then, uh, by the way, Cleveland is one of my favorites of yours. Oh, thank you. uh, yeah, but I, I had I had feeling that you have using this um, parts of your language gifts in the writing of poetry, uh, not not thinking too much how the audience, how your readers will perceive uh, if they don't know Chinese or Cantonese, for example. Well, I feel as if I hope the poem's interesting enough that the reader will go look up those words, you know. And on the other hand, um, that's something I think poets have been doing for a long time, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, poets of all different cultures, you know, they put a lot of other languages into their their poems, you know. I think it um, it accounts for the kind of global experience of some some imaginations, you know, and. Uh, I just wanted to account for all of who I was, you know, and I speak both languages, so I wanted everything in there, you know. Uh, I did have some sense that that was going to be kind of poetry of uh, more and more people willing to be bilingual, or, you know, and that there would be that kind of poem appearing more and more, you know, and so it was, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Leon. It was an honor, and uh, I'd like to thank the uh, festival as well by giving me this opportunity. I think that's time now to open, uh, welcome questions from the floor. Next. Oh. Hello. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, of course, uh, Julia asked you a lot of questions on your poetry, and uh, every, well, the whole conversation was quite interesting. I would like to listen a little bit also about your personal uh, history, because of course you have um, a remarkable life somehow, a very different life from, uh, um, well, many others. So uh, I'd like you to share a little bit of what you remember from Macau, for example, because you have been here long ago for the first time, I believe. And also, in which way, uh, I mean, that uh, very different path that your life took influenced your, your work and your poetry? Uh, you know, I'm having trouble hearing. Is anybody else having trouble, or is it just me? It's just me. Wow, no kidding. I think I'm losing my hearing this minute. I barely heard what you said. Yes, that's Yeah, you know, I love your question. Should I, can you hear me better without this or with it? Oh, you know, that's like getting an elephant to talk about elephants. I, I don't, you know, in a way I don't know. Like when my, I told my mother that, that I was coming to Macau, 
She said, oh, I remember that. that that's such a, a, a quiet little town. I, they, they read poetry there? She, I, she, you know, her memory of it is not this Macau. So I, I, my memory of it, I, ha I barely have memories. My, my sharpest memories are of my parents' suffering. My parents' uh, fear. Uh, they were f political fugitives, you know. Uh, my parents' sense of uncertainty, their, their sense of fear, their sense of, you know, of being fugitives, uh, of being uh, somehow illegal, undocumented, unaccounted for, uh, uh, out of favor, you know. Uh, so all of that stuff, I think I assimilated. Um, and I think that's, that might account for why I, I write, you know. Maybe, I don't know, you know, because a lot of people have gone through that and don't write poetry, you know, so I, I don't know. But I was born in Indonesia. I'm Chinese. Um, uh, uh, and my father became a political prisoner, escaped. And, we, uh, and during the escape, uh, we stopped here a while. Then we stopped in Hong Kong and Japan and other different places, you know. Uh, before going to the fleeing to the United States, was that enough? Was that was, it, was, it, was that enough? Yes. For me, I, I, I love that question. I keep asking that, you know. Um, I keep wondering what a, what a good poem does. My own experience is, uh, a, a great poem kind of wipes you clean and reboots you like a computer. It wipes everything else away. It reboots you, it restarts you with a whole new uh, pers perspective. You know, and in between, we, it's just filler. But we're looking for that one experience, you know, just that one completely shutting everything down and starting up again, you know. And I think all great poems do that. Yes. As a student from English literature and a we, me and also my classmates find trouble when reading the poets because it's so difficult to understand each one word they make sense and they make so much meanings to us. So do you feel that uh, I also try to write uh, and I find it's so difficult to express all my thoughts, all my all the things that I want to tell to the others in such a few words, especially for poet, it's just only a few words for you to use to express your thoughts. So, do you feel that kind of pity that you can only you only use poet or only use so few words to express yourself, and how can you manage it? I know this. <clears throat> There's more experience than there is language for that experience, right? And there's more language for experience than there is artistic language. So you see what's going on here? So there's a lot of experience. You, you were experiencing things all night long in your sleep. When you've been experiencing things since you woke up this morning. So there's a lot of experience, but there's not a lot of language for that experience, right? But if you had to write about what happened to you all night, everything you dreamed, everything you remembered, and then all day, and all morning, it, there's more language there than there is a poem. You know, if you had to write about one day of your life, it would take you, you'd have to live a thousand days in order to write that one poem about the one day of your life where all that happened is you saw a cat, you know, or, 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 you, or you saw the face of somebody you loved, or something like that. I mean, it would take you... It, I don't, this kind of rarefication, I don't, I don't know why it's that way, it's, but it, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, I, mm. that rigor, 
That's part of the beauty of making art, you know, because I think poetry deals a lot with what's not said as well as with what's said. It is very much like architecture. You know, we think architecture, the materials of architecture are, you know, drywall, uh, girders, bricks, cement, right? We think it's the materials. But we forget that architecture, the real material of architecture, is space. What I do with this space makes you inhabit it differently. I could tear everything down, use the same concrete, the same wood, the same plaster, the same, and inflect this space so that, let's say, it's a church. Same materials. Space is different. You walk in there different as when you walk in here. This is so echoey and spacey. I feel like I'm already talking into the past. This is weird. Does this feel weird to you? Or is it just my hearing? No? It must be jet lag. It's, it's, it's the echo, right? Is that the echo? It's echoing. Is it not echoing? It makes me feel like I'm talking into the past. I'm talking into a wind tunnel. It's, it's haunting. I feel like I'm dead already, hearing myself kind of echoing back. It's, not, it's a weird feeling, you know. Uh, but you see, space is different, right? So in this way, it isn't just materiality. It's immateriality, space. That is, the, in, in poetry, it's the same way. It's not just the words. It's what's in between the words. It's what's, it's the pauses. It's the uh, silences between the words. They're much bigger, and they're much louder in poetry. The unspoken in poetry is much deeper, and it's noisier, because the unspoken in poetry is full of information. So what you're tr using is a double medium, I think, in poetry, you know. Um, it isn't just what you're framing, it's what you're leaving out, you know. So that's its own um, mm, discipline, r rigor, D does that make sense? I mean, I get impatient reading a lot of words. I feel like, man, get to the point. <laughs> you, you know, like novels drive me crazy. They drive me crazy. I, I pick them up, I go, really? You, you really need 300 pages to say this? Do you? I don't know. And then I start reading. People tell, they hand me books, they say, this is a great novel. Into the third page, I take out my pen, I start lineating. <laughs> Immediately. I, I, don't, I, I hate doing it, but I, I can't help it. R reading is like a crisis for me. I was, just ha I was just talking to a friend of mine. She said, you never read for fun, Leon? I go, what is that? <laughs> what is reading for fun? Reading is like combat. You don't read Heraclitus for fun. You read Cl Heraclitus because you want to know something, right? Because you, you, you feel you don't know enough. Heraclitus has the answer. You don't read Su Dong Po because, nah, you're an aesthetic. You, you, you like poetry. No, you read Su Dong Po because your life is confounding to you. So Su Dong Po clarifies it for you. So I, I, you know, reading for me is uh, is a crisis. That might be because I read in English, which is my second language. It isn't my first language, you know. Or it could just be language is 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 a crisis. I sometimes wonder. Maybe that's why people write poems, because they're, they're, they've been put into crisis, and, and poems are kind of, uh, somebody said, who said they said, all poems should, it goes back to your question, when you said great poem, great, some, somebody said, I don't remember who now, somebody smarter than me, all great poems are emergency poems. There's an emergency to them. You know, like, you had to write that, right? So that kind of crisis that, that you kind of feel, that critical language, you know, that comes through in a poem, I think that that's, uh, I don't remember your question now. <laughs> Do you remember your question? <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> I think I already got the answer, so. Okay. Yeah. And Scarcity of language. <laughs> that's what your question was, right? Yes. I think that, yes. Uh, one of the reasons why I came here was uh, because I found the title in the program quite interesting, Chaos and Order. Sorry, my voice isn't uh, very good. No, uh, I'm losing my hearing. Okay, 
Can you hear what I, if I speak without the microphone? Can, can you understand? That's good, yes. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I came here was because I found the uh, title uh, quite interesting, the chaos and order. And I noticed that in Chinese it's Hundun, uh, which is, uh, yeah, of course, correctly translated as uh, chaos, but normally as order, the opposite of order would be disorder. It's a negative term, and probably in Chinese that would be luan, right? But you chose uh, hundun as chaos, which has chaos, which means chaos not really in the now contemporary colloquial meaning where chaos actually means disorder, but chaos in the sense of hundun rather means like the undifferentiated uh, that where which is not yet where we don't have an order in the sense of putting different things at their respective places but where everything is sort of still in an undifferentiated form right which is not the sense of uh, disorder or chaos right. as we have it in the colloquial usage nowadays right. so when i read this i thought that uh, you, I don't know if you came up with a title yourself or so, but I, I was did just. not, but that's a great title. Oh, right? I see. You didn't even, because maybe you didn't even know about the title then. Yeah, no, I didn't. Yeah, I see, that's why I came here, so. Did you come up with that? <laughs> yeah. that's, a great, that's a great title. Yeah. 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 So, but it's true about poetry. Yeah, so, right. then, and then just, I was just inviting you to say a little bit more about this expecting that the title came you know, from you. I love that. <laughs> I love that title. I'm glad you came. I'm, I'm, glad I'm, I'm glad to be thinking about this. You know, I do feel this. When you write a poem, and this comes back to the question of what a great poem is, I think when we write a poem, when we approach the, uh, the blank page, right, there's a million ways you could say something. You come to the page, so imagine this. This is the way I feel when I'm writing a poem. I am a doorway about the size of a mouse door. There are 10,000 angels, and they're all a mile tall outside of that doorway, and they're all knocking to get through. So I'm this little doorway. I'm going to write one poem. But there are 10,000 poems out there. There are 10,000 ways I can say this. That's the chaos, the uh, uh, the pleroma, right? The unformed, undifferentiated potential. All the different ways you can say this, right? When you say this one poem, this one poem, it has to have so much relief, so much salience, that the differential between the unspoken and the spoken has to be so high. And when we talk about differential, we're talking about Tai Chi. We're talking about when you watch somebody doing Tai Chi, what you want to see is the separation of yin and yang. You want to see all the yang in the one leg and all the yin in the other side of the body. And then you want to see them move. You want to see the differential, extreme differential. You don't want to see this kind of murkiness, right? I mean, I mean the master practitioners, what they're trying to achieve is this kind of high differential, right? You want that kind of high differential in poetry too. You want the feeling, I think, in great poems, you want to feel this could not have, be, could have been said any other way on the one hand, and on the other hand, that poem somehow has to inflect the sense that there are all these other ways behind this poem. You can feel all the other unspoken mm, potential. Um, it's so hard to talk about. You know, we get it in Emily Dickinson. We get it in... Uh, uh, Robert Frost, we get it in Shakespeare, you know, we get it in the Tang Dynasty poets, you know, this sense that this poem is so uh, one of a kind, and on the other hand, they're all, it's just all these other voices are amassing to it of all the potential ways this could have been said. So, I know this really sounds esoteric and stuff, but th that's what I love about poetry. You're hearing all the possible echoes, right? But at the same time, you have this very specific, highly differentiated way of saying this specific thing. 
you know, because if you could gather a poems into an anthology and say, they're all, well, they're all poems about fear of death, right? So it would just be fear of death, page after page after page. But there's something different about each great poem. But at the same time, I don't know. Um, it's like they're all speaking to each other. So that potentiality, that pleroma, that undifferentiated potential is experienced simultaneously with this high sense of relief and uh, figuration, reticulation. Does, does that make sense? So that, I think, uh, I think that's what makes a great poem, is this, this double experience. You know, and any time prose even approaches it, it starts to slide into poetry. You know, when you get the sense of, I, I'm trying to go back to your question of why, um, did you ask something about prose or poetry? I don't remember now, I'm sorry. But I'm, why am I digressing? Because you yeah. wrote a, a memoir and also the uh, poetry collections. Uh, it, it seems oh, that uh, yeah, yeah, you have yeah. a different language also. Right. You seem to prefer the poetic language than the prose, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I think that's why. I think poetry is that language that allows us to hear both, you know? And that's why when you, we hear, like, the great, I don't know, the great poems, um, I don't know, you hear that potential, that undifferentiated potential that's speaking from. You don't just hear the human voice. You hear the human voice drenched in this kind of primordial, uh, undifferentiated, you know? It, 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 great poems do that. They do that very much, you know? And I think that that's, uh, that's one of the hallmarks of great poems. Any other questions? Yes. yes. So, uh, do you know there is one statement that a bilingual or multilingual person can never be a great writer because he has so many culture in his background. He cannot use one. Um, it's use one language really preci preci precisely like the like the other people who is. The, um, that language is their mother language. So how do you view this statement? And how do you view the multiple, uh, the diverse, diversity in your personal background and how it like supports you to be you are now? Well, I, I think this, I think that a person who lives in a monoculture let's say, who grows up in a monoculture, can have the illusion that they're not diverse. But I think deep down, we're, we're manifold in being, you know? Um, let me say this. I, I was noticing something. I'm different when I'm in a public setting. You know, I think I'm different. Uh, I use a different language. I use a different body language. I use a different verbal language, you know. Uh, I'm different than when I am with my family. Uh, uh, I use a different body language with my family, you know. Uh, diff use different verbal language, different registers of language. And then when I'm alone, I'm even different from that, right? So you could say there's a social self uh, public self, then there's a kind of private self, like I, I share with friends, family, then there's a secret self, right, I'm, when I'm alone, uh, but I think there's an unknown self too, a self that's unknown to me, that reveals itself in dreams, in intuitions, in interests, uh, my interests lead me in ways that m m uh, that, I, that surprise me. So I feel as if there might be four selves in me. It may be in all of us. There's a public, a private, uh, a secret, and an unknown self. But here's the thing about those four uh, levels. W the first three levels, I think, the public, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know. The public, the private, and the secret self, even when we're alone, those are all composite selves. 
Do you know the difference? Do you remember the difference between composite numbers and prime numbers we learned when we were children, right? Composite numbers are numbers that are versions of other numbers, right? We are composite. We are versions of our mother. All of us, each of us, we're versions of our father. We're versions of people our age. I'm a version of an Asian American male, you know, of a certain age, a certain time, a certain history, right? I'm, I'm a version of all that. I'm a version of a male, right? But that's our composite self. There's a prime self, too. The prime number is a number that is not a version of other numbers. It's, it's a, 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 a prime number is only divisible by itself and one. I do believe we have the same thing in us, that we have this prime, what do you want to call it? Aspect? Well, we are not like our brothers. We are not like our sisters. We're not like people our age. We're not even like people our own gender. Like, that doesn't even account for us. Uh, I'm not like every other Asian American male. I'm not like every other male. I'm not like my brother. I'm not like my sister. I'm not like you. I'm not like my father. I'm, but I am like that. You're, so there's both, right? So we are this manifold self, right? And I do think that the aesthetic self, the self that emerges when we make art, accounts for all of that. You see? Uh, and, and I think all of that is, is, is a wholeness. I, I think that's possible, you know? And I'm kind of blanking on your question now, but the diversity of self, yes. So my sense of diversity is vertical. It isn't so much, well, I'm Chinese, but I also like Mexican food. I happen to be a uh, living uh, American citizen. And, and, you know, those are all horizontal differentiate. I'm male, you know, I, I'm heterosexual, I'm, you know, 60 years old, I'm this, I'm that. You know, I prefer this kind of music. Those are all kind of, they're just, those are all composites. Do you see what I'm saying? If I tell you what kind of music I like, well, I'm a version of that kind of person who likes that kind of music. Do, do you know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a, a certain type of, of heterosexual maleness. Those are all composite. We're all, do you see what I'm saying? But there is something about me that isn't even human. I think there's something in each of us that is transhuman. Tra that is not species specific. You know, uh, I think when we, yeah, let me just stop there. Then. Do we have any other questions? Since we still have some time, I believe. Okay, uh, now, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. okay. Um, something less philosophical and more like uh, sociological. Do you think that the poetry, that, that poetry in general is dying in this new fast uh, paced world and society we live in with new technologies and so on or in the other hand you think that new technologies actually help people to be more informed and uh, to have more access to art and be more knowledgeable uh, do you have any opinion regarding this like um, social media if the poets should use it or not or if it's uh, the role of the poets to educate society somehow to have a good taste, or uh, do you have any perspective on this subject? Thank you. You know, sometimes I think, and, and I don't know that much about social media, so I, I don't know if, if anything I say has any, uh, I might not even be talking about, I feel as if so, uh, social media is like a big setting for a piece of jewelry. Like the setting is getting made, and I keep, in my most optimistic moments, right, I think, wow, there's going to be a big jewel delivered here, isn't there? The setting is being made. Something wonderful is going to be, and we're all going to be enlightened and walk around, you know, um, creating no carbon footprint, you know. There's going to be no violence in the world. It's going to be wonderful, you know, and I don't know, but... The, it, I, I don't know if that's true, but I have, I don't use, I use email. Is that social media? No, okay. Um, so I don't, I don't think I use social media then. I use a telephone. Is that social media? 
Yeah, I, so I use a telephone and I use email. Not well, not a lot, but uh, I, I haven't, I've kind of, I, I feel as if I'm being left behind, but I mean, I, I get, uh, I sometimes hear about it, and it, that's what it sounds like to me, you know, like, like a great setting for a great necklace is being made, and those stones will be delivered someday, and there's going to be this incredible information we have access to, you know, but I, I don't know. Uh, Liang, before the next question, I think I'm, I, I'd like to jump in uh, uh, this moment. It's because uh, just now you mentioned about space, and I'm sure you're still suffering from jet lag, that you, you're thinking you're talking to the past. Yeah. But actually, I think one of the interesting, uh, I mean, in the, uh, the poetry that you wrote, that you have a, a very dense feeling towards the past. And I know that you have a new collection of poetry. Uh, have the Andres, I think it's pu published, right? It's, the, right? it's published. So do we gonna, do we going to, um, are we gonna to like in a way uh, see more of you looking into the future rather than the past? I, I haven't read this uh, new poetry yet, uh, collection yet, but I know you have one coming, it's called Undressing. I wonder if it's, by the title itself, I was thinking perhaps you are going to really undress after this uh, long journey, starting with Rose, uh, this small bud of Rose, and then come into bloom, and now um, there's a certain point in this time that you are going to unpack those. So can you say a few words about the, the new work and also the yeah. work it's gonna be? I, I don't get undressed, but I undress <laughs> A woman in the uh, my Maybe. wife, yeah. Uh, but uh, it's actually I'm undressing God. It's my obsession with this idea of God, you know. And uh, God is female in this in this uh, collection. I, I don't know why that is, but uh, I I don't know. I, I don't know. Is there any uh, poem that uh, perhaps relate to the other questions that you looked into the past, you looked into your memories, you looked into the legacies that uh, these two worlds that shaped you uh, as a poet? I, I, was, I was thinking about if there is any that you look into the future. For example, you just mentioned that uh, with social media, different medias of representation, different voices. I, I, I'm thinking about whether there is any point that uh, you would talk about this future. I mean, you have a very interesting way of looking at the future and the past in one of your conversations with, uh, I think, with Jensen. You talked about Chinese philosophy of looking always in the front of the eyes, the, the past, mm -hmm. not the future. I, I think perhaps you would like to talk about that as well in terms of uh, time and space. Yeah, I, well, I, I do think the poem, uh, it, poems in this book try to see, try to understand our human predicament and our human mission. I think I set out, I wanted to know, like, so what are we doing? It looks to me like we're destroying the planet. Uh, it seems to me that the verdict is in. There's no human culture that can be maintained except by violence. That really disturb, has been disturbing me for years. So I think th this book of poems looks into that and how that, and why that is so, you know. No human groups uh, can be maintained except by violence, uh, war, Ritual sacrifice, uh, murder, encroachment, uh, expulsion, um, and so mm, the poems in this book try to understand that, and uh, uh, and I think try to see if there is a human future. I think some of it is kind of bleak, uh, you know, but that's just I, th I think sometimes I haven't thought things through. But uh, uh, yeah, the future. You know, I don't know if I'm interested in the future. I don't even know if I have a future, you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. You know, I talked with the, the reporter about this. Um, right before we came on. Uh, it was about the nature of, uh, you know, the Greeks had it right. They said the mother of all inspiration is memory. You know, uh, mezzanine. Right? Uh, uh, me, me, I don't, I'm not, am I saying that word right? But uh, 
but uh, so memory is the, the mother of all yes. the muses, right? Yes. But right. it seems to me that personal memory isn't so much what I'm concerned with. I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's like my soul has a memory that's older than my biology. And I'm trying to remember that, you know. I'm, tr I'm trying to remember my connectedness to something older than the universe. And so it seems to me with, without that memory, I, I don't have much of a future, you know, personally. You know, so, uh, uh, yeah, unless I remember that or my, my origin, you know, which isn't, which isn't only in my parents' biology, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't account for enough somehow, you know. So I think writing for me has been a, a way to account for that, too. So, uh, any questions? Yes. Um, sort of follow-up question to the previous one. Um, the lady mentioned that potentially the new media can be a sort of danger for poetry or literature in general. Um, during your, what you said so far, I noticed that uh, you didn't say anything political. And I sometimes have the feeling that because of the media, uh, there's a second danger for, perhaps for poetry and literature, that it gets politicized very much, and that there is a certain expectation that if an author wants to publish his or her works, they have to take on a certain political attitude, particularly perhaps if they're from Chinese background or so, and not living in China. They uh, sort of, in order to be marketable, in order to be sort of passed on on the social media, they have to take on a certain political attitude. And I sort of found that refreshing that this was absent from what I heard from you so far. So I wonder if you, if you, if you see that as well as a potential danger for the production of poetry and um, literature in general, the sort of political expectations that uh, are sort of um, more or less tied to the image of the author in contemporary society? You know, I love that question. I, I think it's, it's a complicated question. You know, I, a, a lot of the political stuff I hear, <clears throat> a lot of the, the politics that I hear about, the, the arguments that go on, it seems to me they overlook the one anthropological profile, of the human anthropological profile, you know, and that is we are the most, we are one of the most, if not the most, creative, visionary, violent, uh, cruel, insensitive, unconscious, enlightened, uh, loving, tender, terrible species on the planet. I don't care whether you're homosexual, heterosexual, male, female, uh, what color you are, what culture you come from, what country you come from, all human groups, there's absolute proof, anthropological, sociological proof, right? All human groups are maintained by sacrifice, even human sacrifice, uh, encroachment of other, on other, uh, basically all human groups are maintained by violence. It seems to me that political fact hasn't been met yet, uh, hasn't been dealt with yet. Like, what, what does that mean? You know, don't, don't, don't pick a side so quickly before, it's, it's just another violent, it's just another voice that's being maintained by violence. Or, or, you know, every culture, every culture, you know, the culture I come from the, in the United States, it's maintained by uh, 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 government-sanctioned violence, you know, and every other culture on the planet, right? Small, from small to large. So I, I don't know how to deal with that human profile. That anthropological profile troubles me. I mean, it, it really troubles me because I have sons. I look at them and I think, I, I, I remember raising them and saying things to them and thinking, wait a minute. I just said that to them, but if I play that out to the nth degree, that is a culture of violence that I am 
giving to my sons to inherit. You know, and I keep thinking, is that all that's possible, being a human being? That ultimately that's what we're... And, and how is art in cahoots with that? Like, we have a National Endowment for the Arts in the United States, right? They're threatening to defund the National Endowment for the Arts. The, all the artists or poets are up in arms, right? And I think, well, okay, so finally, we get to not be in cahoots with this blood money, right? But all the poets and artists are saying, I want more blood money. <laughs> and I think, okay, yeah, maybe I do too. Maybe I don't. I don't know. Where am I on this? I don't know how to think about it. I don't know how to get my head around it. You know, I don't know how to get my head around the fact that, you know, my life as an artist is, is underwritten by culture, which is underwritten by violence. How do we deal with that? I, I don't think, I, I don't think, I, I don't, I, no, I don't know. I, I don't know how to deal with that. You know, so that's the, if there is any politics that I'm obsessed with, that, that is the one. I, but I don't know how that translates politically you know, or sociologically, but, but thank you for what you're saying, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not that I'm avoiding it, you know, it's just more like I'm, there's a, I feel like there's a deeper issue, maybe, we haven't come to terms with, you know, or faced or something, you know, and so all the factional, factioning that happens, they're all using the same they don't even see that they're using the same strategies of violence, expulsion, exclusion, that human groups have used for years, you know, and, and uh, uh, so th that's a real issue, you know. Okay, so on that very human and very uh, uh, romantic vision of what's going to happen, I uh, once again thank you all for uh, joining me in welcoming um, the only for this session this afternoon. And uh, thank you very much.